It's such a hard thing to describe to someone, but the patients who do the best and who are the most successful can build this mental image of where their tongue is and how they chew, how they swallow, how they collect food to form a bolus. And they really need that as part of therapy, but it gets overlooked a lot. Once something becomes published and it's in the literature, now we start to have standards that we can operate from. So if the field's not gonna organize itself, at least you can start to get the research to kind of guide the field. Anyone can look at their nose and be like, oh, my nose is stuffy, so I have to mouth breathe. And I think that's a really easy step. Like if you don't have any background, any knowledge, just learn about your own nose and ask patients about their nasal breathing. Get ready for your unofficial dental hygiene podcast. These are the tales of two hygienists, one East Coast RDH and one West Coast guy genist. Listen as they tackle the profession of dental hygiene with humor and enthusiasm. Now, please join Michelle Strange and Andrew Johnston as they tell you a tale of two hygienists. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of A Tale of Two Hygienists, episode number 258. My name is Andrew. And this is Michelle. Welcome to our podcast. Welcome to the podcast, everybody. This is a dental podcast. We do focus on a lot of dental hygiene stuff, but it's all encompassing. Lots and lots of stuff. If you were so lucky to listen to last week's episode, we even talked about non-dental stuff on the occasion. So welcome yes, to our on show. on the occasion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. I can't believe how long this has gone. And I love December's because we can, like, I like the recap of the year. I said last week, I can't believe it's even December of 2020. It's bonkers. Blows my mind. It is. It is bonkers. Uh, but, it, you know, I think for us, I know the world has had kind of a crazy and tumultuous world. But I think for the podcast, you know, we've, we've done very well. We're um, very lucky to be in a, in a situation where we can continue to give back. And we have awesome guests who have the time to be able to give to our audience. And so we're really appreciative of them. Uh, we have amazing listeners who... Which, by the way, we should probably read that review real quick here in a minute if you don't if you don't Ooh, mind. Yeah. Um, but the you know listeners that give us great feedback, we have we're really excited. I I don't know if did we talk about this yet on the, on the podcast, but we had like a brainstorming session, taking all of the input that you guys gave us and creating a content calendar for 2021 based on all of your input. And we had so much response. I was actually shocked about how many people replied to all the things that they want to hear. So thank you everyone for doing no that. No faith in our listeners. I hear that's what I hear. <laughs> I, it's not faith. It's just that, you know how it is. It's like you have to take, it's not I just, know. it's like five steps to be able to get to a certain thing. And that's hard sometimes, but you're right. I should give our listeners a lot more credit. Thank you everybody for being awesome. We have a very engaged audience. We really do. It's such an engaged audience. Yeah. I and I try to, and I tell people that they're, and actually I've just recently, and I don't know why, but people have like, oh, like there's that much to talk about in dentistry. I was like, yeah, <laughs> we, there's a lot to talk about there's in dentistry so much. actually. And, and we do keep revisiting a few things, but it, there's just so much more to talk about and our listeners eat it up. Like it's so, I'm so amazed at the people who listen to an hour long podcast. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> on dental hygiene. Uh, all right. So what's our review? Our review is actually from our uh, friend of the show, Manal. Oh. And she gave us five stars. Uh, it's titled Great Information. And she says, I absolutely love this podcast. It's a great mix between clinical and business setting for hygienists. As a hygienist, I look forward to hearing from the experts and the fabulous hosts. They make the episodes fun to listen to. That's awesome. And if you didn't already go listen to her podcast, that was just like a few episodes back. And she also has a great Instagram and Facebook page that I would highly encourage you to check out as well. Can you hear my dog? Can you hear Lola just like I, walking around? I can't. Her little cl clicky toes? Clicky toes. She had a little accident the other day. So the fact that she's walking around without limping, I'm like, that's great. But also calm down. Like you should be healing. <laughs> Take a Aww, seat, Lola. Poor Lola. It's just one of the cutest dogs in the whole entire world. She's a sweet girl. She's the best. I know. I love you. I love you. I love you. So, Child. okay. So on that note, we, I, have, <laughs> to the podcast. I have something very exciting to talk about that, Michelle, if you want to just check out for the next like two minutes, 
It's on mergers and acquisitions within dentistry. Oh yeah, done. And let me go get a glass of wine. <laughs> so here's the thing, everyone. I I love the business side of dentistry, and we've talked about DSOs in several of our shows. And if you're not familiar with that, it's a dental service organization or dental support organization, depending on how you term it, whatever you want. And and basically, these are big companies that own multiple offices across multiple states. And the role of a DSO is really to be there to do the HR, to do the payroll, to do all of the, like the kind of the business functions of an office so that clinicians can do the clinical work, right? So a lot of times dentists go into the practice, hygienists go into the practice thinking, hey, I'm just going to focus on here's disease, here's the treatment, and here's the prevention for it. But unfortunately, what ends up happening is they have to do the business side of it too. So then they kind of get a little bit, they don't succeed as much as they could. Yeah. Me. You're talking about me right now? Nope. I mean, maybe, but look, I mean, <laughs> the shoe fits. So some news has come out since, well, I mean, it was actually back in November was the first big one. And this is when Aspen, everyone's heard of Aspen. Aspen Dental Management has announced it has reached an agreement with Sun Capital Partners to inquire Clear Choice. And Clear Choice is a pretty, they're not as big as like an Aspen, but they're dental implant centers. They do a lot of all on fours, a lot of big implant cases. Yeah. Did, were they the ones that started dentures in a day kind of thing? Oh, I couldn't tell you who started all of that kind of stuff. I, I just don't, I don't think that I know that part of it, but Aspen by itself is a 850 locations. So it's huge. So the acquisition of a component now of their business, that's going to be focusing on which Aspen already did a bunch of dentures and extraction stuff anyway. Now they're going to be adding all of the expertise for this implant stuff. I'm just super excited about it. So I'm, I'm happy like for this particular type of merger which I know, you know, no one really else cares about me, but here's another thing that happened, Michelle. Oh, you're not, you're checked out. Sorry. December 2nd, just a few days ago from when we're recording this smile brands announced today that it completed the acquisition of Midwest dental and Midwest has over 230 offices, mostly in the Midwest and new England. And our friend Tammy Filipiak works there. That's huge news. Between the two companies, the combined company um, will be one of the largest DSOs in the country, representing 650 offices, 8,000 employees, including 2,200 dentists and hygienists operating in 30 states. That's some news. I mean, what do you think this actually means for dentistry? Oh, man. Why is that a big deal other than they just get bigger? So, okay. So I have two things. One is what I want to happen. And one is what I think is actually going to happen. The one thing that I'm hoping is that acquisition upon acquisition allows, again, like I said, the, the the whole point of a DSO is to support the clinicians, right? So hopefully this means that dentists and hygienists can go in and do their job more effectively. Obviously, that makes it makes for like the owner or company, as long as they're, you know, pro each individual office is profitable, then they'll be a lot more profitable and everyone's going to get, you know, rich doing this on that's like way up at the top. But the treatment can be top notch. What I know from T Tammy Filipiak and how she teaches and how she's led Midwest for so long is, and she keeps her hygiene or like the, well, all the dental team, but specifically hygiene really up to date with the new staging and grading and the perio and all of that. Like she is so immersed in all of that, that I would hope that she can then say, Hey, smile brands, if you're not quite there, let me help you show, show you how we are successful. And so that we are now calibrated across the country in a much better way than we've ever been. Because as you know, that is the biggest problem. As I do a lot of like the recruiting for my company, that is a huge issue that I'm seeing is that I would ask about, Hey, how, tell me about your perio protocol. And it's like all over the board. So yeah, I'm hoping for like, that's, I guess like my, my pipe dream. I hope that's what happens. But I think in reality, what's going to end up happening is that it's going to be unaffected and there's not gonna be a whole lot of change other than I think a lot more of the new grads are going to be going into a DSO pra supported practice. I think it's gonna be business as usual, honestly. So, hmm. well, I mean, I do, I would love to see that dream come true though. Like to see more calibration, to see the level of education. I don't even know if this is the right way of saying it, but have a little reciprocity so that it can go from East coast to West coast to Midwest, like yeah. 
all the states and yes, of course, your patient population is going to change. There's nuances in all levels of disease. So you just, you have to figure those out. But like you said, the staging and the grading, like so many people haven't even integrated that into their patient care. Um, me being one of them, like I haven't been in an office long enough with the staging and the grading for me to practice it so that I feel confident and calling it what it is as much as as many courses as I take. I love all the courses and Katrina did a great one for us on the podcast, but I still haven't like put it into practice because I keep going into these offices that don't put it into practice. So, and I'm already in there stirring up stuff with infection control. So, well, get, getting back to the whole to stir anymore, <laughs> <laughs> getting back to the whole reciprocity thing though. I think that that is, we've talked about reciprocity a bunch of times on this podcast and I think that there's a way that it can be done. And I think that there is, a lot when you have these DSOs who are straddling these borders of states that like are arbitrary, like who decided which longitude and latitude these borderlines are going to be on. Like I get that part, but what I love about it though, is that if we are going to have change, it's going to take some power and some money. And I think that larger corporations, whether it's going to be from, you know, the product side of things or whether it's going to be from, you know, DSOs or, or even ADA, ADHA, like getting on the same page or doing something to move the needle. It's going to take money and power, unfortunately, to change a lot of that. So if you have a Smile Brands who now has 650 offices or whatever it is, and the Heartlands and all these other ones, now that now we're in the thousands of offices and tens of thousands of clinicians all fighting for the same thing, I think that's how you get change done. So hopefully, hopefully that'll be one of the great things that can come from this. Well, we, and we also know, unfortunately, with power, you can go one way or the other. And let's just, we're just fingers crossed that it, it goes to the side that serves our patients and the oral health of the nation in a positive way. Yeah. Well, I think that's the ri- ridiculous thing about this, though, is, is it really depends on the level of education that your leader has. So I think someone like a Tammy who is, gets it, you know, and I'm not trying to like, I mean, Tammy's a good friend, but like, then she, I'm sure she has her faults too. It's not all perfect, perfect, but I keep talking about all the good stuff, but she's so dialed in that she has helped her company be profitable while still doing the right thing for the patients. You know what I mean? Like there's a way to do, like if you do the right thing for your patients, you will be filthy rich. If I'm just being very blunt about it, but it's when we start taking shortcuts, it's when we start doing the bloody profies. It's when we start trying to do eight patients in an hour ridiculousness and just having a bunch of people polish all the time. And then we just go in and scrape a tooth and call it good. Like that's when it gets out of hand and we're not doing anyone a service. We're not giving them the education level that they should, they should be receiving in the offices. And so many people have been on this podcast saying that same exact thing Mm -hmm. that they have been very successful by looking at value-based or health-based production goals. And that's a, I just wish more people could hear that and embrace it because I, and I did just read on Facebook the other day, which I haven't been spending much time on there um, and happier for it, but they were asking if um, anybody can successfully do profies without an assistant with bite wings in 30 to 45 minutes. And I was like, well, define success. Like, yeah. can you do it from start to end and complete it? Probably. But what's that quality care? What's your infection control? What's that patient quality of care? Mm. Like, and define profi, right? Like if you have people like you, oh yeah, definitely. Like, let's get that. Define profi. Like, like a true, true, real, like, like working on you. Like I don't think it would take me all that long to really probably clean your teeth, right? But yeah. you're going to be so far out you know, on that little bell curve, can be so far to the left of that bell curve that you're going to be such an outlier. Yeah, but then I think also like we, if we want to simplify who we are and what we can do for patient care, yeah, polish and scale can be super fast. I mean, we've all done it. Like I've been in and out in 20 minutes and sometimes I'm just like, let me go back and hit a molar or two just to make sure because it's almost like this is, this doesn't seem like work right now. And this is a great intro into like our episode today, but I can't tell you how long I mean, long it takes me to sometimes have a conversation about tethered tissue and airway and sleep and their nutrition and the medications that they're on. Like, you know, I think we are very reductive to who we are and what we can do. And yeah, if we're just scaling and polishing floss fluoride and out the door, yeah, I mean, 20 minutes, I can probably get that done. But it's, it's all the other things that create that holistic care 
of a patient that uh, we we don't give time to. And I saw the other day, um, not to digress too much from our episode today, but I saw a breakdown. I, I always giggle at these breakdowns like that you see of an appointment. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm talking about like an hour. Five like, minutes here, three minutes here, two minutes. Yes, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And the allocation to infection control was four minutes. How? I, exactly. I was like, four minutes? There are products that have a kill time of three minutes. Like, I don't think you're dis- get, you're doing op turnover in four minutes. It's just not. But that's that's what we keep seeing more and more. And, you know, now... If we were doing teledentistry and things like that, yeah, I could probably scale polish, get them out the door, and then have a follow-up uh, teledent appointment where I talk to them about their oral health and their home care and the tie- tethered tissue that I'm seeing, take all the pictures and talk to them when they're not taking up chair time. I think that's a very feasible course of action if you want to like hustle through scale and polish and fluoride, but I don't know. I don't want to digress too much, but... Uh, Because we have another great episode this week. Um, We're bringing back uh, a guest that started. I always love this. The ones that start the year come back on and finish it out with us. Um, And so we did an entire series on myofunctional therapy at the beginning of 2020 in January. And Sarah's so sweet to still say that that's her favorite interview she's ever done. (laughs) because she got to really kind of dive deep into this uh, topic. And she has a really new, exciting um, adventure that she talks about, and I guess collaboration that she talks about during this episode. So I'm really excited for her. And um, if you guys haven't checked out that series back in January, I would definitely do that. And then I would even go one step farther. And is it farther or further? I say further, but it could be farther. Further. I think it is further because farther is actual distance. So one step further and then check out the airway series that we did with Julia Whirl and Cindy um, Johnson, Cindy Johnson back in uh, the year prior to that. So I just want to say thank you so much to Sarah Hornsby for coming back on and, you know, recapping and talking to us a little bit about nasal breathing and comorbidities and COVID because that's such an important conversation to be having right now. So enjoy this episode with Sarah Hornsby. Hey, Michelle. Yeah. It's time for the interview. Oh, but I had something else to say. We need to let the experts talk now. Fine. Okay, listeners, I love an end of the year recap, uh, especially with a guest who had such a popular series. And so I want to welcome back to the podcast, Sarah Hornsby. Welcome. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. And I'm like super excited that the podcast that we did last year was so popular. I guess the beginning of this year Uh, seems like forever ago. I know. I mean, what has changed in this year since we we recorded with like December 2019 and then we released it January 2020 and an entire lifetime has since occurred. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, totally. Like it's career crazy. changes, lifetime changes. It seems so crazy. And yeah, I mean, here we are. It seems like that was so so long ago. <laughs> It, it really does feel like that. And I have also just been like, anytime people talk about my functional therapy, even my friends that are struggling with their newborns, I just send them your episode. You just did so, such a wonderful job of explaining to us uh, tongue posture and airway and development. It was just such a great series. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I had a really good time doing it. I I always tell people because um, I recommend if they're interested in doing my course, or if they want to learn more about me and who I am, I always recommend that they go listen to that podcast series that you have. And I always say that it was seriously one of the most fun interviews because you totally get what I do. Um, I've given a ton of interviews and done a lot of podcasts before. And typically, they're kind of cheesy. I have like, (laughs) you know, 30 (laughs) minutes and they're like, ha ha ha. So you do exercises for snoring. And, you know, it's kind of like, Mm. they don't take it seriously. And, um, this, our, um, series that we did, I feel like I got to go so in depth and explain so much more than I've ever had the opportunity to in other interviews. So it was, it was awesome for me. Well, I am very excited for you to come back because I think we, our discussion and the way that you explained how important nasal breathing is and tongue posture. I mean, it's truly something I, I talk about with my patients 
all the time. You actually were very generous in sending me some photos of like tethered tissue as well for a course. And I actually just a few weeks ago, every single patient I saw this one day had a tongue tie, all the adults, yeah. all adults. It's and so it's so amazing. And I actually just included that in so I just gave a course uh, with Perry Implant Advisory on saving natural teeth. I usually talk about implants a lot, but I, I did this course um, because I do love saving natural teeth. I think that's very mm -hmm. important. And, you know, I kind of captured a few uh, cases with my patients because I was explaining to them about home care, right? We talk home care, brushing, flossing, all this stuff. And I was like, how often do you think about self-cleansing and how important that is? And how often you've looked in somebody's mouth and you see like that, you know, squirrel pouch of food down in the vestibule. And you're just like, how yeah. do you not know that that is there? And then I asked them to put their tongue there and almost none of them, pretty much none of them can do that. And yeah. I was explaining how important tethered tissues are to self-cleansing. And we can't really get upset with people when they can't even get their dang tongue up there. And we're like, class five restorations all the way around. How do you keep doing this to yourself? And we're like, look at their tongue. I know. Well, I think, you know, the conversation with myofunctional therapy, we always take it to these higher levels of like sleep apnea and TMD and facial growth and development in kids, but we can really drill in. And I've, I've been trying to do this more and more honing in on like the purely dental aspects of helping a patient with their myofunctional symptoms. So like you said, like it, it comes down to like basic perio and oral cleansing issues. And if we can't even at least acknowledge that, how can we get patients and, and doctors who are not familiar with these things to see even the bigger picture with airway and breathing and, and all the more complex stuff? Um, it all starts with increased inflammation, um, increased risk for perio issues, increased risk for tooth loss and tooth decay. And that's all stemmed directly from mouth breathing. So, oh, and from the, the restricted freedom, not being able to actually clean the food from the vestibules and the posterior teeth, you know? Absolutely. And, you know, I, I, for years before I knew about myofunctional and, you know, yeah, tongue ties, you know, the, the typical, like, uh, can you do like the oral assessment? Yes. Ankle glossia noted, blah, blah, blah. Like, and then we didn't do anything about it. You know, we didn't mm -hmm. say anything, but I always did this thing with my patients called the tongue test. And I was like, once you're done brushing, take your tongue and touch all the parts of your teeth. And if they still feel furry and unclean, you just hit the high spots again. Like just take the brush in there and hit those high spots. And I mean, it took me so many years ago. Holy crap, how my patients can't even put their tongue back there. <laughs> and I'm over here like, yeah, and they have no idea. And so I'm like expecting, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's truly the definition of insanity. I'm just asking the same thing over and over again, thinking like, oh, I'm different. I'm doing this different. I'm going to really help my patients. And I'm expecting different results every time they come in. And I'm never check, checking that that tethered uh, yeah. tissue. And I'm like, oh. Yeah, I was just, um, I just gave um, one of my lectures last night and we were talking about the, the topic of awareness, which I think gets really overlooked in the field. Um, I, I haven't really taken any course in myofunctional therapy where they focus heavily on the patient's awareness of their own lips and tongue. We, we focus a lot on exercises, but you know, 99% of the time the patient's not doing exercises and they have to build like a, a super strong awareness of where their tongue is inside their mouth and how they're swallowing, how their lips are resting, how it's such a hard thing to describe to someone, but the patients who do the best and who are the most successful can build this mental image of where their tongue is and how they chew, how they swallow, how they collect food to form a bolus. And they really need that as part of therapy, but it gets overlooked a lot. So when you're explaining to patients about, you know, can you swipe your tongue across your teeth? They seriously don't know what they don't know. And they, they mm -hmm. don't know what they can't even do. So it's super interesting. I love that you brought that up. No. And thank you for building upon that too, because in, even in my mind, um, I'm thinking because as a, a myo patient in a way, trying to do my own exercises and just being super aware of um, mouth breathing and where's my tongue at any time and like how long it actually did take me to bring to yeah. have that self-awareness as a professional, as somebody who's learning all these things and like wanting to become more aware, uh, you know, honestly, I will say mask wearing has made that. I think mm. a lot more people are aware of it. Uh, at least that's the feedback I get from people. And 
you know, we keep hearing things about mask mouth and I'm like, yeah, but y'all like, I feel like almost it's a blessing in disguise. Cause when people are like, you know, I just, I suck in that air and the mask comes with it. I'm like, well, that's an obvious sign that you yeah. are mouth breathing that you probably would have never been aware of prior to wearing a mask. And totally. so what are your thoughts on like mask wearing now and the rate of mouth breathing? And I mean, not to like throw you uh, into this, such a heavy topic, but like with COVID and mask wearing and mouth breathing, any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I think it's definitely a way that patients or anyone can start to be aware of how, how difficult it is to breathe through their nose with the mask on. So I think it it's definitely an awareness factor. It is kind of like a litmus test, I guess, in some ways to see, can someone easily breathe through their nose? If they can't, um, wearing a mask will be a lot harder for them. The other really interesting thing that I think brings us back to like a Buteco breathing technique is wearing a mask actually kind of helps build up CO2 and um, can help increase people's CO2 tolerance. And so it could almost be like an exercise, which sounds really weird. But if you can get good at breathing with a mask on, it's probably like in some weird way good. I don't think it should be too challenging, like with the, the really heavy duty masks um, and 95s and stuff. I think that's probably too much. Yeah, I mean, it can almost be like an exercise. That sounds funny, but... <laughs> So what you're saying is kind of going against a lot of excuses that people are like, oh, I can't wear this because I'm, I'm, you know, breathing in too much CO2 or I'm breathing out and then breathing back in something that's not good for my body because we mm -hmm. hear that a lot, right? Well, they have, I, I believe it's Patrick McEwen that has like a, a mask that you can wear during exercise or they had it. I, I haven't seen it in a while, but it was actually meant to do just that, like make the breathing a little bit more challenging um, and in order to build up your CO2 tolerance. So that's kind of what the masks are doing in general. Oh, wow. Then us dental experts, our dental professionals should be like champions of that. Except most people, you notice, um, they actually, and I even remember doing it when, back when I was doing clinical hygiene. If the mask rides up too high, a lot of people start to open their mouth, like their, their jaw. Oh, to yeah. To down. like pull it down, right? Yeah. So a lot of times I think a lot of hygienists say I only mouth breathe or my mouth is only open when I wear my mask. So there's a lot yeah. of interesting things going on with the mask wearing and, and I'm, it's hard to say, mm -hmm. like, you know, what's going on with that. What's going on. I would even build on that because, you know, I've since gone and deep dove into infection prevention and, you know, started a company around that with my friend India. And, you know, we talk a lot about putting your mask on properly in the dental office, like, you know, making sure you pinch it around the nose and like really create that seal down the cheekbones, pull it underneath the chin. And it's nice to have that metal strip underneath it. And what I keep trying to tell people, I'm like, you have to be very aware of where you seat that mask on the bridge of your nose, because me being a mouth breather my whole dang life, you know, I, the whole left side of my like nostril and the tissue is just very overgrown and I'm working to, you know, challenge that and expand that by no nasal breathing more and more, but it does not take much, um, compression just below the bony part of the nose for me not to breathe very well. Therefore, yeah. I open up my mask, mouth. And so I'm trying to encourage people like to just really be aware of that. Because if that's a struggle for me and a trigger for me to pop my mouth open, I'm sure it's the same for a lot of other people. Oh, for sure. Like I said, there's so many dynamics going on with mm -hmm. the mask wearing. I think some are good, you know, maybe like the the exercise stuff I was talking about, but I think a lot of them are challenging for people and mouth breathing under a mask kind of defeats a lot of the purpose of the mask, you know? So when we breathe through our mouth, our bodies are not able to naturally clean and filter and warm and, you know, add nitric oxide to the air as we breathe it in through our nose. That's what our nose is meant to do. So I think your nose is your body's natural gateway to preventing viruses and bacteria and stuff like that um, from getting in. And so putting the mask over you mouth breathing is kind of like, well, shouldn't your nose just be doing that? <laughs> Right. <laughs> Shouldn't your nose be doing that? And, you know, I think they also came a clear has been pushing how important it is to like flush out the sinuses on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And um, so they had a new kind of campaign out about clear and the xylitol flushing out bacteria and viruses in addition with the saline and just like breathing through your nose, keeping it flush. Don't let anything kind of get caught in there 
and create an infection. Yeah. I, I heard um, Dr. Zaghi, um, he's uh, one of the, he's an ENT with the Breathe Institute that a lot of people in the myofunctional therapy world are super aware of him. He's like a celebrity in our world. Um, but he talks about nasal, nasal cleansing or nasal hygiene. And just like we do dental hygiene and oral hygiene, like we should all learn how to clear our noses, how to cleanse our noses, how to use um, nasal sprays and do nasal rinsing. But that's never a conversation that we have, you know, with our kids, we teach them to brush their teeth, but we don't teach them how to clear their nose or clean their nose. And it's super important. So I, I do that a lot as part of my therapy programs, actually. That's so great. Um, I actually probably should add, include some of that because I have a form that Carrie Ivitson actually put together on pH uh, neutral products. And I give those to my patients and I kind of check off all the boxes of things that I suggested. And one of those is clear nasal spray. And I always talk about the importance of, you know, I talked to you about mouth breathing and putting your tongue in the right place, but it really is not going to be super easy until like we really clean out that nose and make it just easier for you to breathe. And so that's on there and I always check it off, but I don't talk about nasal hygiene. So I like that. Isn't that interesting? I like it. I <laughs> yeah, like that a lot. So I think anybody who was in this before COVID could have seen how it was going to really kind of wreak havoc on American population because we are a lot of mouth breathers and we have a lot of chronic inflammation and I know a lot of people were talking comorbidities and this is completely anecdotal. So don't come at me with anything later on. This is just my, my thoughts and hypothesis that can be disproven later on. But I think um, when we, a lot of people were focusing so heavily on comorbidities being like diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And I would even like to put in there like mouth breathing is a comorbidity and vitamin D our lack of vitamin D is a comorbidity. And I think we're really starting to see a lot more info about that. And For sure. Think yeah, I think um, mouth breathing, mouth breathing, snoring, sleep apnea, they're all comorbidities for increased risk for, for COVID for sure. And in any, any like respiratory mm -hmm. illness, you know, whatever virus, regular flu, COVID, anything that uh, you can do. I mean, honestly, if you're snoring and mouth breathing all night, you're, you're almost guaranteed to get sick. You know, it's crazy. Well, I can imagine if your bed partner is maybe asymptomatic, asymptomatic and has a heavy viral load and is also mouth breathing and snoring. And then you are as not like, of course you're going to get it. Of course, for sure. Yeah. Like super chronically inflamed all the time. I don't know if we talked about nasal nitric oxide last time very, um, I was on here. Did we go into that very much? Do you remember? I think we did, but I would love to hear it again. <laughs> yeah. So it's a really cool molecule and I, I'm like nerdy and I love like talking about it and learning about stuff like this, but basically it's made in our noses and in our sinuses. And every time we do an inhale through our nose, our airway, so like our, our nasal passageways and our upper airway is kind of bathed in this molecule. And it is antimicrobial, antibacterial, anti-inflammatory. And so it's really part of the way our nose is designed to work to help us stay healthy and, and prevent illness. So one of the best things that you can do to build up nasal nitric oxide is humming. So there's been a, a few people talking about humming. And I think it, I mean, don't quote me on the numbers, but I think like five minutes of humming can increase your nasal nitric oxide by like 50,000 times. I mean, it's something crazy. So if you just hum and hum and hum, you're basically building up the nasal nitric oxide. And then if you keep nasal breathing, you're really getting high doses of it. And apparently that's one of the best things to help prevent COVID. So it's pretty cool. And it's an easy trick. Hmm. And is it the reverb from humming that, or is it like the, the way that you're breathing while humming, like what's what, the mode of action? Um, and I don't know. So the, the person I heard speak about this, um, is Dr. Rosalba Courtney, and she's like a breathing expert and she's, she's amazing. She's actually based out of Australia and she did a lecture through the AAPMD early on in COVID. And she was talking about this and, I always knew about the benefits of, of nasal nitric oxide, but I didn't realize that humming was like a way to like super boost it. And I'm pretty sure there's been studies coming out on it. If you Google it, if anybody's listening and wants to Google, I'm pretty sure there's some pretty good research about humming nasal nitric oxide and COVID. I think they're pretty new. Wow. 
Oh, that's yeah. so good. Yeah. We'll we'll take a deep dive there. And <laughs> I'm really excited that I, I feel like more people are talking about the nose and maybe going in, maybe I need to look up the, the term nasal hygiene or nose hygiene. I actually just got a webinar notification from Infection Control Today, which is, uh, you know, a newsletter that I get that's for infection preventionists, mostly in hospitals, but I always think that they have such great articles. And one of them was about cleaning out the nose of patients that are hospitalized. And, you know, I've been like, my whole entire research for my master's was oral care for critically ill um, in the ICUs. Like, so I did my research for that in here in Charleston. And, you know, it's gotten a lot better. Um, it's still a little dated. And if you ask me, but the fact that they're even thinking about it and now we're looking at nose hygiene and I'm like, wow, isn't that cool? Maybe we're starting to get it. Yeah. <laughs> we understand that is cool. Yeah. So, I, I like it. I'm, I'm excited. And um, since our last podcast, there's been a lot of changes in the field with COVID that have been, I think, shaking things up. I mean, doing things online has become the way to do therapy. That's, I don't know if you want to get into that, but I yeah. think that's big change. And I'm seeing a lot of myofunctional therapists or dental hygienists, you know, training to become myofunctional therapists who want to practice exclusively online. And I think there's some big career shifts happening in the dental world with hygienists and dentists. And I'm seeing it really a lot through myofunctional therapy. So I think I probably explained this last time, but I'll, I'll recap for everyone listening. I've been practicing myofunctional therapy since 2010. I had an in-person practice. I saw patients for about four and a half years. And then around 2015, I transitioned my practice to be completely and entirely online. And so I had been seeing patients doing therapy like that since, you know, since then. And it was something that I figured out systems around and I created, you know, protocols and figured out ways to like be able to do an exam and to get all of the things that I would normally do with a patient in person. I came up with systems to do it online. And that came with some degree of criticism from people who said, you can't do that. It's impossible. It doesn't work. You're not actually helping people. And anyone who knows me knows that I wouldn't just be treating patients and taking their money and, and getting bad results. Like I couldn't live with myself if I was doing that. I'm not, it's not about money for me. Like I'm not going to do bad therapy just to take people's money, you know? And so what I think it allowed me to do is be able to increase access to care and access to resources for people who didn't have therapists in their area. And there's so few of us anyway, to begin with that it was very needed. So long story short, um, that was always a little bit controversial until literally COVID. <laughs> and now <laughs> it's come full circle. And um, now I, in the past however many months, it's been eight months, I've had a lot of people approaching me saying, how do you do this? How do you make it work? How do you do your evaluation? How do you mail out patient kits? Like what, what, are, what are you doing to make this so easy and successful? So that's a big change. And, and now a lot of the hygienists who are going through like my program or getting training in general, they're wanting to start off fully online. So huge shifts are happening. Oh, that I actually love hearing that. And, you know, it's funny is that I'm working a little bit with Mouthwatch and Teledent. And before I like joined the actual team, I kept telling people, I was like, you guys are missing an opportunity to connect with your patients during the shutdown. Like, you know, there is so much that we could do for prevention. Maybe this is the time where in an appointment you brought up nutrition or you brought up, you know, airway, you brought up snoring and you just didn't have time to discuss it. Like have a video call with them. You mm -hmm. have the opportunity to reach out to the, your patients and I don't know, maybe you can charge out for it um, because a lot of at the time teledentistry was um, getting like reimbursed with by insurance companies, but even not like a lot of people were just sitting at home and doing nothing. Some people were getting paid, some people weren't. And I was like, just reach out then for just customer loyalty, like really totally. build that rapport and that relationship and make sure that they know that like, you know, their oral health is so critical during this time. We Let's talk about your brushing and flossing the last time or brushing and cleaning between your teeth. Let's talk about, you know, I was really concerned about that scalloped tongue. Hey, you wear a CPAP machine. We're learning more about COVID and sleep apnea. 
And everyone looked at me like I had three damn heads and they just could not comprehend. And the silver lining for me is for COVID is that people know how to do a Zoom. They know how to do a video call now. I mean, some are still a little awkward with it, but that kind of communication is kind of the norm now, wouldn't you say? Yeah, oh, for sure. And and that's actually one of the one of the side effects that I have been loving about COVID is for years I've been saying, why can't we just do a lot of this stuff online? Like, why do I need to go to the bank? Like, why can't, why do I physically need to drive there? I don't understand. Like, why can't I do these type of things? Like I, I work online. I do things fully online. I figured it out. Why are these like massive companies not able to figure out the resources to make this stuff more convenient for their customers? And guess what? <laughs> my, my like requests are, are coming true, you know? So um, not that I like being stuck at home and having to do everything online, but I released a car during COVID. So um, I turned in my old car. I did all the paperwork online. And then I literally went into the dealership. They gave me the keys. I signed some paperwork and it was the easiest process ever. And I thought, why couldn't we do this in the normal world? Why did we have to wait until a pandemic to be able to like, you know, yeah. figure out how to make stuff convenient for people. So I, I kind of love that about it, but I'm ready to go back to like normal. <laughs> to kind of seeing some people. I mean, I definitely think we're going to see the shift in a lot of patient care and a lot of interaction. And quite honestly, like we needed a, uh, we needed the financial impact for people to like start doing, getting their resources and going, oh, okay. Like we could do this online <laughs> now. I mean, what were some other like huge impacts um, in the world of breathing and Mayo and um, airway and all that jazz that you have noticed? Have Is there anything I think that awareness, maybe I haven't asked you? Awareness has increased around breathing in general, which is good for the field. Um, I think, like you said, um, there's so many opportunities for education. I have noticed booming changes in online courses and I think that's a double-edged sword. I mean, in, in some ways it makes me a little nervous. I see tons of myofunctional courses popping up all over the place. And I think, you know, the way the internet works, you don't actually have to be an expert or a professional to teach a course. You just have to have a good website. So I've seen a lot of information and almost like an information overload while people are at home, they're putting together courses and they're like, well, you know, I'm not working, so I'm just gonna do this online thing. So it, like I said, it's a double-edged sword. I love having more information get out there, but I also think like, like the field of myofunctional therapy is already a little controversial. It's a little bit wild west. And I think I don't wanna push it over the limit where now people look at it and like the medical world and the physicians and, and the, the doctors can't take it seriously because we've got, you know, build your myo biz, make 10,000 a month doing myofunctional therapy. Oh, yeah. and, and I'm just like, this is so salesy. It's so used car. It's not what I, I mean, we need to keep like our professional standards high and we need to prove to like the medical and dental worlds that this is a legitimate field and, and stuff like that makes me a little nervous. I, I've noticed that. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you have any, have you seen anything like that? No, but it makes me wonder if like, that's why my state board and here in good old South Carolina does not want us to do biofunctional therapy because we just got a little note saying, um, do not even think about it to which a few of us were like, um, excuse me, no, like, um, that's not gonna work for us. So we're gonna have to have a bigger conversation. So luckily, we were gonna, we're gonna do something in January to discuss it a little bit fur farther. But I'm curious, maybe I know that they're a little fearful of the speech pathology, or speech language world, if I had to guess. Also, I think they're just not knowledgeable about the topic, therefore don't do it. Unfortunately, they, God forbid, they do a little research. And possibly, uh, maybe they're hearing the, that yeah. stuff, which is not something I had considered. So that's, no, that's a little scary. And I totally understand that part. It does make me a, a little you know, concerned. I think um, there's a, a, a lot going on in the myofunctional therapy world on the drama side. <laughs> and I think, as you probably noticed, if you were part of any of like the COVID forums early on in um, what's it called, the pandemic, I noticed a lot of bickering and fighting. And I think that unfortunately gets manifested in like Facebook groups and stuff. And, and I think that happened a lot. I, I see it dying down more now as people are going back to work, but the challenge in, in the field of myofunctional therapy is that it can be done if you're a dental hygienist or if you're a speech pathologist, those are the two main groups of professionals who get training. Some organizations 
and, and I'm kind of one of these people, I, I think, why couldn't a physical therapist do it or a nurse or, you know, somebody with a, a medical degree, a license, I think that that makes sense, an occupational therapist, physical therapist, you know, someone like that. But even that's controversial. Personally, I mean, I'm biased. I think that the hygienist is the best fit. I'm a hygienist. And I think we have such knowledge of the mouth. We understand the structures. We understand the airway. We are, you know, talking about hopefully, um, you know, we all should be talking with our patients about sleep apnea and sleep disorder breathing. The ADA released a, a position statement on that in 2018. And we're supposed to all be doing it now, but I don't know if that happens um, mm -hmm. all the time. But I think the hygienist is in the perfect position to be able to uh, help patients with this. And speech pathologists are as well. I'm not discounting them at all. The interesting thing is coming from a dental perspective, I always thought, well, isn't that what speech pathologists do? Aren't they teaching people exercises? And the very interesting thing that I've learned over the years is a lot of speech pathologists don't actually want much to do with myofunctional therapy. It's, it's a very narrow specialized segment of what you can do as a speech language pathologist. And a lot of them are not interested. So I think it crosses over in a lot of areas in their world. Myofunctional exercises are often referred to more as like oral motor exercises with young kids, like I would say three and under, you're not doing true myofunctional therapy or myofunctional exercises. It's actually more like feeding therapy, which is very highly specialized. And, and the speech pathologists who are trained in it have like high level degrees and, and education. And so what happens is I think the speech pathologists who are at that high level and they have that like extra level of knowledge and they're actually doing this are very passionate about it. And they don't understand how a dental hygienist who from their perspective, a lot of us don't even have bachelor's degrees and they think I have all this training. How can you come in and say that you're helping? And they're looking at it through a different lens. And so I, I understand the controversies between hygienists and speech pathologists, but that's a controversy that's happening online. I understand it. I get it. I've talked to a lot of speech pathologists about it, but I think the majority of speech pathologists, they're really great. And they would, they're like, if you're a hygienist and you want to do this, like, I don't want to do it. You, you go for it. So that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. And I think that just goes back to the fact that uh, I actually, I, during, I don't know if it was during COVID or right, right before COVID actually happened, I put a blog on my website. Cause I was like, there has to be more to, to dental hygiene than just like scaling teeth. And I'm so tired of my profession being diminished to like, Oh, you know, I, cause it, there was a few articles that came out like I, end of last year, maybe that was like uh hygienist, easy job, clock in, clock out things that you can leave at work. And I'm like, yeah, diagnose someone with oral cancer and try to leave that at work. Like, it's just not, yeah going to happen. And I think our, our career and our profession has been reduced to just scaling teeth and people don't realize that you have pathology, you have head and neck anatomy, you know, we take a ton of pharmacology and embryology. And so we have the foundation for that. And I, I just think sadly it's been reductive, you know, like everybody has reduced us to teeth cleaners and they don't put the connection that like, oh, oh, oh girl, you, you do have almost a bachelor's degree when you graduate. And, oh, I didn't realize you took all those classes well, and there's a yeah, lot, like some more hygienists. education and you, you got this. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of hygienists who do have bachelor's degrees and even like you said, a master's degrees. So I think, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that, um, that, that kind of arguing happens in the field. I think one thing that I really try hard with and one of the things that I'm doing so much um, in working with the Breathe Institute is we're really trying to increase people's collaboration. You know, we don't need to fight amongst ourselves. Like we have bigger battles. We have, you know, bigger things. Like there's so many doctors and health professionals and patients who don't even know about any of this stuff. And here we are, fighting in our small little community when we could be using that energy towards the much bigger picture and spreading awareness, growing the field. And so that's what I try to focus on. You know, I, I see the arguing, I don't really take place or take part of it. I acknowledge it. And I, I know that a lot of new hygienists who get into the field and they're trying to research on Facebook, they see it. And that's what makes me feel a little bit bad about it is that 
I, I think it can reflect poorly on the entire community. And then, yeah, with the the pop up courses about you know make money doing this, um, I think that's a little that's not great. But the good news is we've got a lot of really legit research coming out in the field that is supporting that everything question. that we're doing. I love it. So tell me what's going on with you and your new journey. I've been working with the Breathe Institute for a while, but I have kind of a, a big announcement I guess I might as well make on here. I am joining forces. So my 12 week program that I have been doing for the past four years, it's for hygienists who want to become myofunctional therapists. And they want to mentor along the way. That program is now being offered as part of the Breathe Institute. And so we're really joining forces. Like it's basically like we're kind of doing a merger, <laughs> which is fun. Love it. And so they're going to offer that as part of their Breathe course series. And I'm super excited about it. So that is kind of the, the introductory course that they're going to offer. I've also spent the last five months building a course through them with their lead myofunctional therapist, Sonda Valku Pinkerton, and with a colleague of ours, Diane Barr, who is a speech language pathologist and she specializes in feeding. So I've learned a ton about that from her. We are building a nine month program called the Myo Masterminds program. So oh, wow. the Breed Institute is now offering two myofunctional therapy courses, mine, the Myo Mentor program, and then the Myo Mastermind program, which is meant to be for more advanced practice practitioners. So they're really trying to, to step up with the education that they're offering. And through the Breathe Institute, we're really, really trying to get standardization. So one of the main problems with myofunctional therapy is no matter what course you take, there isn't a neutral, like a board exam that you have to pass or no matter where you got trained, you go pass a board exam like we do for our dental hygiene licenses, which would make a lot of sense. We don't have that. But what we're trying to do through the Breathe Institute, which is really led by Dr. Zaghi because he's so passionate about research, is um, trying to establish multi-center research to create standardization for what exercises we do, how do we do the exam. And once something becomes published and it's in the literature, now we start to have standards that we can operate from. So if the field's not going to organize itself, at least you can start to get the research to kind of guide the field. And I, I think that's, that's pretty exciting. So, Oh, that's definitely something I can get behind. That's very smart. How long would you need to be in Mayo to do like a Mayo master course? Like, is there uh, like a minimum? So, you know, for instance, I went through your wonderful program and learned a ton I don't actively practice it, but I definitely harass my patients on a day. And anytime I see them, I'm like, let me teach you some. Yeah, I, I love that you took the course. I thought that was so fun. I'm like, yay. <laughs> no, so I enjoyed happy. it. I enjoyed it. And unfortunately, I didn't finish the last like a few ones because that's when uh, COVID did happen. And I went like full infection control mode. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a webinar every dang night. I was like, I can't keep up, but it was, it was yeah, great. That's okay. great. That's okay. The the calls are recorded. They're all up there. So you can access them at any time if you haven't got a chance to catch up. But oh, yeah, perfect. as far as um, the, the mastermind program through the Breathe Institute, basically you have to have taken an introductory training program and you have to have seen like five to 10 patients. So part of that is because they want you to submit case studies we want the participants to have experience working with patients. I think one of the biggest problems that hygienists face is we're all really eager to learn and take courses, but the scariest thing is seeing your first patient. So it's something I'm super passionate about is like not just getting all the book knowledge and attending webinars and courses, but my big thing is that I, I try to get my students to, before they graduate from my 12 week program, I want them to have their first patient lined up and I actually want to help them through seeing their first patient. So I have this part of the program that's an online internship. I mean, it's the dental hygiene school model, but like done with myofunctional therapy where the student gets to be a student, the patient knows they're a total newbie and they don't have to worry about it. Just like when you're in hygiene school and you're like, how do I hold the instrument and how do I perio chart? You know, um, the patient knows you're brand new. And so it takes that pressure off of you. So the patient gets a discounted rate for the therapy. And then the hygienist gets to like actually see the first patient because that's what holds people up. It's, it's so much easier to read a book, take a course, join a webinar, but the scariest, hardest thing is to see your first patient. So that's my mission is to get everyone to see their first patient. Ah, oh, so true. And I would say the same for like motivational interviewing. Like I always <laughs> I read these books and then I go and I 
bomb all of the time. <laughs> but it practice makes perfect. Practice I can't imagine perfect. you bombing. You're like such a good speaker and everything. Oh, thank you. But I do have the I'm a reactionary person and I am a speaker. I want to teach. I want to tell, like, obviously I know things I, you should know them <laughs> and instead of like engaging the patient. And actually I was just challenged to, uh, and probably the biggest challenge that I've had in a while from a patient with, in regards to motivational interviewing, because this one particular patient was saying the most ridiculous things and uh, about, I mean, I just, I, for the sake of like not giving out PHI, like I was like, and and to a point where like in the middle of the point, I was like, why are you doing that? <laughs> I was like, I was so not the proper response, which I got, but I was just like burned out from the insanity that I was hearing coming from this patient's mouth and things that they were up to and their little home regimens and the lack of even wanting to hear what I had to say that could help them. And, and I just, I kind of lashed out, but that's me in my in my practice of like, I have to get better at it. I have to learn to ask these open-ended questions and engage them in a way that holds them accountable and makes them want to make the changes and all of that. But it, you know, I, I played the part of like expert in the room for so many years and it's just been such a hard like shift. <laughs> I get it. Yeah, I totally get it. It, I think that is the one thing about doing myofunctional therapy is if the patient is not on board, it's not a treatment. Like it's a program. Like people have, you know, with it, at least in my practice and, and what I teach is a 12 session program. Like it's not just, okay, see you in six months. It's really important for patients to understand it and buy into it. And I think as hygienists, we're such, so I've, I've never met a hygienist who wasn't passionate about educating, education, you know, patient education. And so I think that's one of the reasons that hygienists are so drawn to the therapy is that's pretty much what it is. Yes, you teach exercises, but the majority of the, exor the exercises are easy. It's uh, helping a patient understand why they need it, why it's going to help them, why they need to put in all this time and energy and dedication, um, because it's a lot of work, you know? I mean, anyone who's worked with a physical therapist and they give you exercise you have to do at home, you're with them for several months, it's hard. And, and I literally, I tell patients that up front, I'm like, this is hard. I get it if it's not the right time. And I find more and more that when I just am super honest up front with people, like this is a commitment. It's not a magic bullet. It's not a magic pill. It takes a lot of work and you have to be ready for it. And if you're ready, I am ready to help you. But if you're not, that's okay. You know, let me know when you are. It's, yeah. I don't want people to get into a program that they can't finish. You know, it doesn't feel good for me. It doesn't feel good for them, for their kids, for anyone. So that's so true. And the one thing that I would tell listeners who maybe you didn't hear the original episode, you know, series that we did definitely go check that out. Um, but I think that I really do enjoy outside of the science, outside of the, the path physiology that, uh, you know, that we all kind of gravitate towards because we're all science nerds. I think I really do love that, that connection that I can't get, you know, like sometimes with the, the patient in the hour, I'm like, I have so much more to say. And there's something I could have taught them. And you're just like, I got to get the plaque off. I got to get the calculus off. I got to get the stain off. And then there's an exam and a room turnover and all blah, 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 all that stuff. Like Mayo and that interaction with the patient is truly that one-on-one -on -one that sometimes we just like, that's all we want sometimes for our patients. <laughs> I and totally you can agree. really get it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, I, I love the fact that I get to meet with people for a session once every two weeks, and I'm going to be seeing them for a total of, you know, somewhere around seven to nine months and probably following up with them for a year to 18 months. And I get to know people really well. And, you know, some patients, I, I still think I can think of a handful that I'm like friends with to this day, because you know, you spend a year of your life, like helping this person and um, talking with them and, and coaching them through a lot of these things that are challenging. And they're, they're so grateful to you as well. And I think that's, that's why I love working with adults. Um, kids need this therapy, like kids are in the best possible position to benefit from it. But they don't know anything. They don't they haven't struggled. They don't know that they have problems. Adults know and adults are so grateful when they feel changes and when they feel better, when they're sleeping better and when their pain is gone. 
And so it's so rewarding for me. And maybe that's like a really selfish thing is I'm like, yeah, I'm working with these patients because it makes me feel good. <laughs> but it, it, it's really, it's motivating. And, and so I, I love feeling like I'm impacting my patients' lives in a big way. And like I said, I'm still, I'm still friends with, with a handful of people that I've helped through really tough, you know, issues with TMJ, pain and um, jaw surgeries and, you know, severe sleep apnea and stuff like that. So I love it. No, you're so right. And I think we're like, we're real relationship builders, you know, we're really caregivers and this really kind of, it just motivates you to want to like create that relationship and make sure that they're healthy. I'm pretty sure I told the story of my friend and her baby being tongue tied mm -hmm. in our original series. I'd and love to know the update. That little girl is thriving, thriving. Yay. Yes. And just a recap is that I, my friend had a baby. I was out of the country, didn't get to see her until she probably was like seven weeks old. But that whole seven weeks was like, baby doesn't sleep, baby's sitting up, they're about to put uh, her or they already had her on medications, they were about to diagnose her with some kind of like, immune disease, or like, I don't even know what you I don't even know what they were trying to diagnose her with. And I was like snuggling this little baby. And I was like, she, her tongue has not gone to the roof of her mouth all time. And you can see the tongue tie. And literally the week after she got it snipped, immediately went off her acid reflux, immediately started sleeping at night, immediately started eating, immediately was no longer constipated. And now is like thriving. And like the parents were healthier, they're better, they're happier. Like she's a thriving little one. And I just feel like even if you're not going to practice Mayo, like at least understand the basics, especially with your new moms and your pregnant uh, patients. If you are seeing little kids, which I'm in this private practice uh, now, just temping. And I, I was like, please don't give me kids. Like y'all have done it to me twice now. I think I've shown that this is not my <laughs> demographic because they were like, take a bite wing on the six-year-old. I was like, that's a fairy tale. I don't think that's something that happened. <laughs> Oh my gosh, you crack me up. Yeah, no, like I mean, people do I, this. I love kids too, but I much prefer working with adults. <laughs> like, no, I'm real good. Like, give me, uh, like, I, obviously, I, you've given me two tries. I am very okay with giving you my weaknesses. I am not embarrassed. I am not ashamed. <laughs> Please only give me them if this is the emergency case situation. <laughs> but if you are seeing these kids, even sporadically like I do or try to, it's so important just to understand the basics and like how the tongue should rest and how it should move and like identify, are they, are they struggling? Are they six years old and still on like acid reflux medicine? Like these are things that we're like, red flag, stop sign, like everybody halt. I don't even want to, I don't even want to polish the plaque off your teeth because I think we have a bigger conversation to have here. And I, I just think that what I've learned from you and taking all these courses and stuff has been maybe not bringing me a new job or anything, but it's affecting my care with my patients so drastically that I really do think I'm making such a bigger change outside of scalar in hand. Yeah, no, you're, um, your friend's baby getting better. I mean, that's, that's amazing. That's, that's super exciting. And I think it's going to also set up that little girl for optimal facial growth and jaw development, optimal airway development. So if we can start to look at the things that we're doing with the babies and the really young kids as like literally preventing a lifetime of bigger problems later down the road, it becomes so important you know, when people say, well, it's just a mild tongue tie or, you know, they're, they're gaining weight with breastfeeding, which is the biggest challenge is people say, well, if they're gaining weight, the baby's fine. Um, there's a lot more to a breastfeeding, um, than gaining weight. You know, it's, it's also getting that proper oral function and it lays the foundation for so much of our oral development, actually all of our oral development as, as we grow from babies. So it's really amazing. So I'm, I'm happy to hear the story had like a good outcome. <laughs> Yes, it did. And I would love just to kind of recap, like you said, sometimes um, just bringing the awareness back to dental, like, yeah, okay, like maybe you're not into the airway world and you're not talking sleep with your patient, you're not, you're not talking snoring. I would love just to kind of recap some of the things that mouth breathing, not no nasal breathing, tethered tissue could create in the dental world. And my first thing that comes to mind is like tonsil stones. 
Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So tonsil stones, I mean, anytime you're mouth breathing, you're going to have increased risk for inflammation in your tonsils and adenoids and all that. So yeah, tonsil stones for sure. Something that I'll, I'll try to quote from um, a dentist who's a friend of mine who's amazing. Um, her name's Dr. Courtney, Courtney Levine. And she is the first dentist I've, I've talked with that um, really made the connection for me with all the patients that we see for cosmetic dentistry, like veneers, crowns, like all the, the, the cosmetic restorative stuff, all of those patients that are chipping their teeth and grinding their teeth down, they've all got airway issues. So it's so hard to avoid this stuff. Like if you're a cosmetic dentist doing veneers and your patient has airway issues and you're not doing airway because it's not your thing, those veneers are not going to be stable. So I think grinding, clenching, trauma to teeth, broken teeth, it's something we see every day in dentistry, but you have to kind of ask why, you know, why are these people breaking their teeth like this? And it's because when you can't breathe at night and your body is put into a sympathetic state, you're in constant fight flight mode while you sleep. And one of the body's responses is to move the mandible and clench the teeth. And it's really fascinating. So that um, perio issues, I personally think, and, and again, I don't think a lot of the stuff we don't have research on, we, we understand it clinically, but we need more research. Um, I think the patients who all um, need dentures, I think our, our denture population, they all have myofunctional and airway issues. They, they lose their teeth for a reason. It's not just hygiene. It's not just the bacteria. Those are contributing factors. But man, I, when I look at a lot of denture patients, they're tongue tied. And I just think, is it really like this, <laughs> this common? And, and it, it is, unfortunately, the um, soft tissue dysfunction is really, really, really common. And I think that is also what makes us start to doubt, like, how can it be that common? We would all know about it if it was. So people who get into this automatically start questioning themselves, thinking, am I overdiagnosing? Am I crazy? Like this many people can't be tongue tied. Um, this many people can't be mouth breathing but they oh, are. Yes. I said and that too. I did too. Yes. I I mean, I even asked Julia Worrell on the airway episode that I did the year before you. And I was like, I feel like you guys are painting this as like the panacea of health. Like, I feel like this is just the trendy thing right now. And I mean, I have 100% walked that back because it's almost like it's harder to find somebody that doesn't have the tongue tie that doesn't have the tethered tissues that doesn't have the airway issues the the tongue posture issues if i found that person it's almost like a true profi patient i'm like that's a fairy tale too like please like somebody's bleeding somewhere no one's actually really healthy and it's just a fairy tale and but we're all calling it you know a profi i feel like the same thing with airway and tongue ties and stuff yeah, they describe it really well. If anyone's curious, like, how can it be so common? You really have to start looking back at like the book um, Jaws by um, Sandra Kahn, who's a dentist. And Weston Price was a dentist in the early like 1900s who was looking at indigenous populations and trying to figure out why do people from certain cultures and certain populations have straight teeth and no tooth decay and they have such good jaw development and wide palates and they don't have all these modern problems. Then you can even go one step beyond him further back to a man who I'm pretty sure was just a researcher, explorer type of guy, George Catlin. And he was really one of the first people to document mouth breathing and sleep apnea. He didn't have a term for it, but um, he was the, doing the same thing in like the 1830s, looking at why are certain populations in South America and, you know, populations of people who haven't been exposed to modern diet and, you know, modern industry, why do they have such fewer problems with their breathing? And he was, a, he was really focused on the breathing, not so much tongue posture and jaws, but he said that, you know, unhealthy people in modern cultures and civilizations are mouth breathers and healthy people in these um, indigenous populations where people are still eating, you know, their traditional diets and living more traditional lives. These populations, um, they aren't sick and they're all nasal breathers. And so I think what's happened and why all this is so common is we've had generations like built upon generations of these issues. And so the epigenetic changes over five, six generations, I mean, how, how many generations have happened since 1800? I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I think if they were noticing these problems in like the 1830s, and now we've had several more generations after that, 
pretty soon you get up to a population where the normal becomes the dysfunctional because it's so expressed through, and it's not true like evolution, it's epigenetic changes to how our genes are expressed. And that's really where we are in the, the modern world with tongue ties and malocclusion. So. Yes, I think that's a great, I mean, we, I keep saying this in the infection control space, we have normalized errors. We have normalized the dysfunction. And I feel like that's in a lot of things in our world these days. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, you can go into like the food system. There's a big influence on like the food we eat and the, you know, lack of chewing. And I mean, you can seriously go down the rabbit hole with like gut health and oh my gosh. So <laughs> Uh, vitamin D, absolutely. Um, which I think I just heard, and I haven't read the study yet, but I just heard something about a homeless population in this one place in a homeless shelter where almost all of them, or half of them, I should say, tested positive as asymptomatic COVID cases, but they weren't showing the, like I said, symptoms. And they're likening it or hypothesizing, I should say, to the fact that they're always outside and they get a ton of vitamin D. Interesting. Whoa, right? that's kind of trippy. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, it, again, it's just postulating the the connection between uh, vitamin D and this, but it just is very strange that this half this shelter was asymptomatic and nobody's like, you know, hacking up along going on a ventilator. So, yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot to say about vitamin D. Just to close this out, I'm just curious if you have like, I don't know, three to five little things that a hygienist that hasn't really gone through all of this, maybe they've listened to your series, they didn't take the course, maybe they're hearing this recap, maybe they've heard some courses over the last year. Like, what are some things that we could talk to our patients about without having like a ton of background? And mine is like just mouth closed, but yeah. any thoughts on that? The, the best thing you can do is start to observe yourself because, you know, we're talking about how common these things are. My number one message to all of us as hygienists and healthcare providers in general is start to pay attention to your own breathing. Going back to the beginning of this, we talked about the nose and nasal hygiene. How often is your nose blocked up? How often are you stuffy or congested? How often are you mouth breathing versus nose breathing? And if you get a really solid understanding of where you, you are personally, now you can start to understand what patients are going to go through if you start to talk about this with your patients. So I think first start with you. And then the conversation that you can have is all about, have you noticed how often you breathe through your nose? Have you noticed um, when you're prone to having allergies or congestion? Like, I think just talking with people and helping them get familiar in the same way, like it's important to breathe through your nose. Like how often is your nose clear enough to do that? And, and I think starting with the nose and not even worrying about the mouth or the tongue or anything else, the airway, the sleep, that's all complicated, but anyone can look at their nose and be like, oh, my nose is stuffy, so I have to mouth breathe. And I think that's a really easy step. Like if you don't have any background, any knowledge, just learn about your own nose and ask patients about their nasal breathing. I think that's great. That's a wonderful, that yeah, you that's super helpful. Good. Any other final thoughts? Because I appreciate, again, so much of your time. I mean, you gave us so much information at the beginning of this year, just a beautiful series that took us a few hours. So I so very much appreciate that time. And I appreciate this recap. So any yeah. last little things that I um, maybe didn't discuss? And also, where can people find you and take your courses? Yeah. Um, no, I, I love doing this. So I, I'm happy. Anytime you want to do a podcast, I will totally do more. And we, we oh can my talk. God, don't more. offer that up. I'll take you up on it way too often. <laughs> All right, good. Yeah. Um, the thing to take away is pay attention to this field. You guys, it's growing. We've got a huge body of research that is happening. Like literally there's four studies that the Breathe Institute is working on this year that will come out in 2021. Um, they just released a, a study in 2019 uh, late 2019, like I would say December ish. And it was about, um, the connection between tongue tie, clenching and grinding, snoring and, uh, facial pain and tension. It's an amazing study. And it's a, it's a level three study. It's really good. There's another study that was just released about pediatric, um, grinding and how it's connected to mouth breathing versus nasal breathing, tongue tie, tongue mobility, and tonsil size. And wow. so, like I said, there's four other um, studies that are going to be published and that are in the process of, of, it's a long process to get research 
out there, but um, one's on, on lip taping and nasal breathing. One is on myofunctional therapy and compensations during exercises. One that I'm really excited about is, how, is about CBCT scans of the airway and head position and how head position affects our reading of the airway. And then one is about orthodontic appliances. We have so many orthodontic appliances and techniques and we need to know which ones work and which ones don't and in what population. So this is gonna be looking at Alpha appliance, Vivos appliance, rapid palatal expanders, like any type of appliance that does expansion with whatever technique they're using, it's going to be breaking down all those techniques and figuring out what works and what doesn't and for who. So we've got really great stuff coming and people always say, oh, myofunctional therapy, there's not research about it. There is a lot and it's growing and growing. So pay attention to that stuff. And then if you want more information, I know you asked me to kind of talk about um, where people can find me. You can go to my website, myomentor.com. You can look me up. Um, if you just Google Sarah Hornsby, my YouTube channel will come up. You guys can find me on Instagram. I'm sure Michelle will link, you know, information about me. Um, I've got another website, sarahkhornsby.com, which has a lot of the courses and stuff that I'm doing outside of uh, the 12 week program that I offer in myofunctional therapy. And also I would look up the Breathe Institute and Dr. Zaghi because he's really leading all of this research that we're putting out in the field. He's an ENT, Harvard graduate, Stanford graduate. I mean, he is like a super brilliant guy. He's super passionate about research and myofunctional therapy, which I love. So I think if anyone's gonna make big changes, it's the Breathe Institute in the field. And now I get to work with them and join forces. So I'm super honored and excited. Well, congratulations. It's well-deserved. You are a fabulous uh, educator for all of us. I just so very much appreciate your time and all the information that you've taught us. And definitely, I actually send my patients to your YouTube page because I'm like, I'm not even going to do this justice. Like, this is how you can stretch your tongue, all this stuff. I, and now that I'm wearing a mask, you know, 24 seven in the office, like I, it's not something I can do so easily. So I'm like, this <laughs> is not going to make any sense because my face is covered go look at this website, go look at this YouTube page. It's so, so super helpful. So um, thank you for all that knowledge, all those resources. Aww. And again, for coming on. And I just, it, you're always such a joy to talk to. I could just like nerd out with you for hours. Yeah, I'm so thankful to to be here. And I hope someday, like I seriously want to come hang out in uh, Charleston with you. I've never been to South Carolina, so I've got to go. And after all this COVID stuff, um, we, we've got to meet up in person someday. Listen, I got dates penciled in. I am going like once everything is clean, we got a vaccine. We're all getting healthy again. I'm like, y'all, I'm going to take like six months off and I'm just going to go see the people that I adore now and drink some wine and chat nerdy science stuff with you. I can't Aww, wait. Very fun. All well, right. Well, thank, thank you again. again. This is awesome. I swear, like now that I can't travel, I can't have all these moments. And we did say we hopefully we can see each other one day, Sarah and I, but I'm like my nerd heart just, oh, I love these episodes where I just learn. And I love seeing people who are just so dang smart and like excelling in their, their expertise. God, makes me so happy. For me, it's like the passion, right? It's when you are so excitable about speaking about what you love. And that is a lot of our, our guests are expert in their field, but when they have that one little extra bit that makes it fun to listen to. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's just palpable. Like you can, you can feel it in the air when they are, and they know what they're talking about and they can say it so eloquently mm -hmm. and make you understand such a big topic. And they just break it down these little nuggets that are just so easy to digest. I just, mm. You know. And I know I said this at the, at the beginning of the year, but like I went back and watched some of her videos and you just see it in her eyes too. Like audio podcasts are awesome, but if you guys ever get a chance to check out some of the videos that she's done, like it'll knock your socks off. She's awesome. Yeah. Very engaging. She's got a great YouTube, very good YouTube channel. Highly suggest that you go check that out. And then while you're checking out other people's stuff, why don't you go ahead and like our Instagram account or our Facebook account and head over to our website, atela2hygienist.com and subscribe to our newsletter um, because we give out all kinds of stuff on those newsletters. Um, our CE that is sponsored by PDT. We like to give you reminders of ones that are expiring. And also in our show notes, if 
show notes are super hard for you to get on your like phone to get the CE link to go take the test at CE Zoom, then you can go to our website at tale2atgenis.com and even just put in the search, like the topic or the episode number, or just click listen, and you can go and get that straight from your computer. So I don't think a lot of people know that part, but you can do that and then subscribe to our newsletter. And if you want to send us an email, you can do that at michelle at a tale of two hygienist.com or Andrew at a tale of two hygienist.com. And we would love a review. OMG, we would love a review on iTunes or your listening app. That would be awesome. Wow. You done well covering all of that stuff. Good job. Thank you. It's, I've done it once or twice on this or 260 or 260. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Anything else? No, nope, I'm good. All right. Well, we hope you guys have a fabulous week. Take care, everybody. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. I did just hear something recently and I wanted to make it my new sign off. Okay. I'm nervous now. <laughs> no. I don't it's know so I like 2020 this. and COVID. This is it. Stay positive and test negative. Okay. That's 2020. Let's, okay. So let's close this all, Daniel. You just keep that, just keep it rolling. Don't splice any of that out. <laughs> Let her ridiculousness be the truth of what people actually know about her. <laughs> Awesome. All right, guys, stay positive and test negative. Have a great week. Okay. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Y'all.